Well, I am so thankful you are here. Uh, my name is Pastor Nathan Schultz. You can call me Pastor Nathan. You can call me Nathan, whatever is meaningful for you. Uh, so I wanted to recall last week. Uh, last Sunday, we celebrated Jesus' baptism. And, and in it, we talked about identity. Uh, we talked about that we are not solely what we do, what we have, or, or what others say about us. But, but more and most true, we are who Jesus says we are. And, and so Jesus in baptism, he didn't need to be baptized. He didn't need forgiveness. He didn't need to be made a part of God's family. He was already God's son. But what we see is that Jesus identifies with us so that we would actually take on Jesus' identity, that you would have a new relationship with the Father in your baptism. So um, identity is something that is given to us. It comes to us from the outside. It is a word spoken to us. And today, I want you to have another word spoken to you. And here's what I want you to know. Your God has been faithful to you. Beyond all circumstances, beyond everything you felt, the evidence stacked against that truth, your God has been faithful to you. See, that's a, that's a statement or kind of a conclusion you come to if you consider maybe the last year. See, my guess is in the last year, you took some hits, your teeth got kicked in a little bit, life didn't go exactly as planned, right? But if you reflect on those moments, you can now come to a place where you can say, you know what, maybe God has been faithful to me. The problem is you have to go through some difficult times to get to that point. <laughs> to finally say, I believe that God is faithful, you have to go through some dark moments. And I was thinking about this as I reflected on my last year. And as I was thinking about my last year, I thought of moments where I was overwhelmed. Um, despair was the predominant emotion. Um, and just kind of anxiety took over my thoughts. Um, when that happens, what happens is everything in life closes down, so all you can see is the circumstance that is right in front of you. It's all you can see. All you can think of is what's going wrong. And um, I learned that this is actually how our brains work, and so I was nervous that Trent, our med student, would show up. I'm not going to get too deep into it. Don't worry about it. But there's actually, uh, not trying to be cheesy, like three parts to your brain, sometimes even by medical professionals, called the triune brain. I know, it's almost too easy. They put it on a T for me, right? But um, what it is is that there's a part of your brain that does survival, that it responds without rationality. It just responds out of self-preservation. But if you get out of that survival mode, you get to emotion, the things you can feel and, and you can grapple with some of your emotions. And then the third part of your brain is about reflection. It's that you can finally process and even reflect what's going on around you. I thought about some of this as I watched students come here for careful study, and they had exams coming up, and there is no other time I can think of that's more stressful for students. It's exams, right? And um, I see them go through these different parts of their brain, right? The, the exam is coming up tomorrow, and they're like pacing and hitting their head against the wall. They have cold sweats, and they're like, I'm quitting. I'm giving up on it all, right? It's just a survival instinct. Well, maybe you, you kind of have all those responses, and, and then you go to bed with some tears in your eyes. I get it. And then you wake up and you go, okay, I'm still nervous, but I think I can make it. And then you take the exam and you go home to your family, and the next morning you wake up and go, well, that wasn't so bad, was it? Right? But in the moment, there is a circumstance that you can't get out of. You can't see anything from outside of yourself. You're just focused on survival. Today we're going to look at a psalm, uh, Psalm 111. And as I've looked at psalms, and they're kind of like poetry, I've, I've learned that psalms are people who have gone through survival moments. They've moved to emotion, and now they're finally able to reflect 
They're able to reflect and see how God might have been working outside of themselves even when everything was going wrong. And so I have two examples before we jump into Psalm 111. Um, sometimes in our confession and absolution, we sing that one little short song, like, from depths of woe I cry to you, right? Um, in, in Psalm 130, it says, out of the depths, right? And you can imagine the depths. All you can see is everything that's wrong inside of yourself. But it says you cry out to God, and he hears you and says, with you, there is forgiveness, right? The Psalms are a move from a, a panic, a survival instinct, all the way to then reflecting and seeing how God has been working. Uh, again, in, in Psalm 40, we, we see that actually it says, I waited on God. I didn't know where to look. I tried to find the answer inside myself, but I waited. And then he heard me. He delivered me. It says he delivers me out of the pit or a miry bog. I, I thought of that getting out of a miry bog. You think of a, a muddy ground, right? The ground that's thawing after freezing. Your foot sticks, but then you're pulled out. We move from survival to emotion to then reflection. Today, I want you to know that your God has been faithful to you. So take a deep breath and let it out. And my guess is, is that the biggest threat you have right now is that you're around people you don't know, right? You're fairly safe in this moment and you're ready to reflect, to hear that God has been faithful to you. And so here's what the psalm says. It says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. Righteousness, that, that word righteousness, you hear the word right, right? Uh, God is right in the face of wrong. Uh, righteousness endures. Even when everything is wrong, even when life is closing in on yourself, God is right forever, for all time. I was thinking of a moment in this last year where, where life kind of was closing in and I couldn't see outside of myself, and it happened when I was um, in an argument. I was in an argument with an undisclosed person. You can guess who that was. And um, when you get into an argument, I learned that all you can think about is being right. Do you know what I mean? Like, you just want to be right, and you will deploy arguments and reason that actually have no bearing on the real argument, because all you want to do is convince yourself that you are right. And then God says that his righteousness will endure forever. And maybe you think that's a threat, right? Because if God gets to be right, then I have to be wrong. But here's the beauty of God being right. God is righteous not for himself, not so he can be right. God is righteous so he can take what is so wrong and put it on himself. Everything in your life that's gone wrong, the stuff that you've done that you know is wrong, the stuff that is wrong happening around you, it says God is righteous so that he can take all that is wrong onto himself. And that's what you see happen by God in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, Jesus is righteous, does no wrong, but takes everything on to himself and leaves you with a new relationship with the Father. And somehow, if, if you know this, if you know that God has been faithful in this way, all of a sudden, being right during arguments, it's not as important. And all of a sudden you realize that it's not about being right and deploying the right arguments. It's about a relationship. Because that's what God has done for you. See, you need to know when life closes down on itself, when it all goes wrong, God has been exceedingly faithful to you. The psalmist writes again about God's mighty works, and, and here's what he writes. He provides food for those who fear him. 
He remembers his covenant forever. He provides food for those who fear him. Uh, He provides for those who look to him. And it's actually way better than that. Um, I've learned that my needs are met and God provides for me even when I don't look to him. (laughs) It's interesting because um, when I go and buy everything I want, so quickly I can chalk it up to, well, I worked for that paycheck, right? That's mine. I worked hard for it. I, I kind of, when things are really good, I just keep God out of the whole situation. But then when things are bad and I don't have everything I need, when inflation rises and the budget blows up in your face, you go, God, why? And that's a response of survival. That's a response where you bite back at God. But the truth is, is that God provides for you whether you acknowledge him or not. So why not start knowing that God has provided for you? Uh, Jesus actually says, like, guys, there's these birds. They have everything they need. How much more will your God give to you? Maybe in the last year you've gone without. Things have been sparse. Things have been shaky. But your God has been extremely faithful to you. I understand. I, I know that there could be a moment right now where, where you're saying, Pastor, I'm, I'm in the thick of it. Life is going wrong. I don't know how this works out. Um, I wish I could get to that point where I could say God is exceedingly faithful to me, but all the circumstances around me point elsewhere. Uh, there's too much pressure. The, the job is being threatened. The money is tight. Uh, relationships are broken, and I'm losing people that I loved. And it's precisely in that moment where you're vulnerable, where you realize you don't have everything you need found inside of yourself. It's precisely when you're brought to nothing and know that you can't look inside and just muster up enough will to be productive and do enough. It's precisely right there when the psalmist writes this. He sent redemption to his people He remembers his covenant forever. God has worked outside of yourself, outside of your circumstances, outside of everything that has gone wrong, outside of anything you felt or sensed. God has sent himself in Jesus Christ to you so you would know of his great love. So that you would know that despite your circumstances, despite everything going wrong, your God would not give up on you that he actually wants you to be in relationship with him. He's so faithful that he shows Jesus Christ himself faithful to you, even to the point of death. This is what God wants you to know. Even in the moments where everything closes in and you can't see outside, your God has been faithful to you. It is difficult in those moments when everything shuts down and you can't see outside of your circumstances to know that God has been faithful to you. The psalmist knows that, and so he gives us an answer. He writes this, I'll give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright in the congregation. Um, so much of of when we suffer and when we panic is is done alone. And yet he says, I will go to a congregation. Uh, That's another, like, Christian-y word, right? Uh, Not often do you hear that word congregation, but congregation goes beyond club. It goes beyond gathering. It's people who gather for one another. It's you It's God's people gathered together in a time and place to remember his faithfulness. Because that's what we're doing in worship. As I was growing up, I I remember being told by like a very well-meaning older lady that um, going to worship, going to church was her weekly like gas fill-up. 
Have you ever heard that kind of like metaphor, that picture, that, that I have to go to worship because I need my tank to be filled up? And I'm sympathetic, I get it. Life can kick you in the teeth, I know. But, but what I've found when I've treated worship as filling up a gas tank is all it takes is me to drive out onto park and turn left onto Grand to get cut off and the tank goes empty again. <laughs> It, all it takes is the Sunday anxiety of the Monday workday coming, and the tank is empty. No, no, what I think is happening when we come together as God's people is that you don't have the whole picture. You in yourself don't have the whole picture of God's faithfulness. You need other people who can attest to God's faithfulness so that you know in the moments where everything shuts down that God has been faithful. That is the best argument I have for showing up at worship. You can stay home and you can get information dumped from a computer. You can even find better sermons, way better sermons. But to be among God's people, that's how God seems to work. He reminds us of his faithfulness gathered as a congregation. God has been exceedingly faithful to you. You might not see it. You might not even feel it. But know this. In Jesus Christ, he hasn't given up on you. He's placed you into this community so that you might remember his great works. So let's actually attest to that. Let's give a testimony to his great work among us. I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, these words, used by Christians for centuries, give a testimony, it attests to God's mighty work among us, and so we confess together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Amen.